content, a very big academic teaching content in it. Um, and can we have the lights on now, please, because that's the end of the slide. Um, uh, you know, so looking back over this, this whole affair, I have this feeling that the megastructure comes from the schools and goes back to the schools. One can remember the conversations in which megastructure first began to appear, the excitement caused by the Volcker, Derbyshire, uh, Pat Crook, uh, Hertfordshire zone scheme, for instance. You remember the first stirrings of excitement in the schools when it all first began to boil up, long before there were any serious projects to do it in real life. Uh, and now, as I say, there's this feeling that, in various ways, megastructure has crawled back into the schools to die. And uh, I quite definitely feel that I'm, you know, to some extent, pronouncing a funeral oration or exercising the ghost or something like that. It's had a good run for its money. Goodness, it has a good run for our money, is more to the point. Um, but as I, as I say, it seems to me to be the concept academic in derivation and academic in its ultimate destination. I called this lecture uh, megastructure as educational toy. Uh, I think I meant that. I meant it in the first instance that some of the very earliest megastructure models I saw had unmistakably the educational toy aspect about them, that they were almost like sort of, not quite like galt toys, say, because they weren't quite so crudely done as galt toys. I mean, they weren't neat rectangles painted in uh, primary colours or whatever. But they had a sort of take to pieces and assemble thing, which had something of the more active kind of nursery educational toy quality. The one where, uh, you know, the intelligent child has to drop the star-shaped piece of plastic to the star-shaped hole and the triangular piece of plastic to the triangular hole and so on. Many of them had that kind of, I'm afraid, slightly duh quality about there. The marvellous much of their recommendation was this sort of dead stupid quality they had. You know, in a sense, anybody could offer anything as simple as eight vertical pieces of half-inch doweling, a yard of string, and 24 plastic soap dishes from Woolworths as an architectural project. You know, because that is just sort of your description of a rock bottom uh, Wolfgang Döring, uh, you know, megastructure model. You know, this, the guy was offering this as a serious architectural project. Something, something stupid's got to be going on. Uh, it had that sort of quality about it as well, which I think gave it an enormous sort of uh, penetration, that, that these were things which, once seen, were never forgotten. I could, were I a better draftsman and painter, I could, I think, in fact, I think, reconstruct one wall of the fifth-year architecture studio in Rosario, Argentina, in 1968, which had lined up along it 12 or possibly 14, no, I have to think a bit, my total eidetic recall isn't quite certain about that, 12 or possibly 14 uh, megastructure models, about a third of that year's fifth year output of megastructure models, you know, most of which, Argentina being a poor country, were based on basically the soap dish uh, capsule module. Uh, had it been a richer country, it would have been the, the, the two developing dishes face to face like that, which is the German version, you know. Of course, at Yale and Harvard, they would have to be able to afford to have their own capsules specially vacuum formed. Uh, but there's a kind of particular, particular scale of operation which needs to go with the economy of each particular country. Now, each of those things had, in fact, a very clear image quality, which really depended on extremely simple elementary things. Did it have a vertical structure or a diagonal lattice structure or possibly a tension structure? Uh, were the soap dishes all the same colour? Were they in regular horizontal and vertical ranks or were they in a staggered pattern? Did the staggered pattern agree with the stagger of the, uh, of the structure or argue with it? You know, almost you could write a kind of six element identification program and dot them all in, wasn't quite permutating and run a very simple thing. They really were like educational toys, we felt that an intelligent child, someone with no knowledge of architecture, would come along and given the elements, produce something indistinguishable from what these very sophisticated fifth year students have produced. I'd probably be extremely unkind of them, but the air of the thing had. Uh, and it may, may be a comment on the quality of architectural education in the swinging 60s, I don't know. There must be plenty of us present who can remember the swinging 60s make structures of soap dishes and so on. So it's your memory lane now rather than mine. Um, first of all, what about the ex-Cal Poly uh, 
megastructures in. Did they bring it with them from no, Poly no, as a physical object or only the I, intention to do it? Th there's one guy that teaches there whose name I can't remember. Very small. Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and he has been on this tech since about 68 mm. and still goes on and on and on. Yeah, and right, on. but he burned my ear off for yeah. about an hour and a half. I've had, had that for time. hours on end. Yeah. Mm. You got the impression the school felt that was its finest achievement. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. But he's very dynamic. Uh, oh, very small. Yeah. And very tall. Yes. Yes. <laughs> The interesting thing, uh, go back to Hafner, yeah. um, that, that when he uh, left Graz and went to UCLA, he was not pushing megastructure at all. No, he was on to mathematical he models. He got drafted back into it by the pressure of local events. Yes. I mean, I'm sure that Henry hired him in the first place. Oh, I'm he sure. saw him as a megastructure, sure. as an urban designer. Sure. Right. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I, I won't be here next week, but I'm intrigued to know, this is sort of an obvious question, yeah. whether you are going to do, as part of the chat part, or it will it emerge as a good question, mm -hmm. um, whether you're going to do various ways of, of developing other megastructures, that, that whether the megastructure led to other things, which couldn't have quite been led to, has the megastructure not happened, or is that another whole story? Um, no, it has to be touched on in part. Uh, there are some developments within megastructures which have actually lead to other things, and I think you've got to be pursued through. Uh, I don't think we talk about them next week. That's, that's a bit in the middle of the book, uh, which is, I can see roughly how it's got to be written, but I'm a long way from getting my ideas properly in shape. I, I take your point. I, mean, I, I think I arrived at a similar conclusion myself some time ago. Uh, but have not really had a chance to develop it very much. <coughs> <coughs> I, mean, I, think I was just thinking that, that you know, Hafner is a very typical example mm. of, of maybe a, an Austrian or Germanic tradition where it leads to a reaction, a hot reaction away from, whereas um, maybe it's back to an earlier concept about the English way of never quite buying the whole mm. bag. You know, yeah. that, that even when involved in megastructures, one's already mentally thinking, thinking what else you can do. And then retrospection, I'm thinking of the business of I drew the cut out, put it into the 1967. Uh, one was poking fun at one's own thing, saying, you know, ah, oh, anybody can do this. And it, in fact, but you did call it a megastructure, and it's the first time that Marky Brown used the word. Yeah, the yeah. other thing was, you know, the private jokes about each bit was the, the, the toniness and the yeah. you know, that and so right. on. Um, that one was very consciously sort of um, maybe defensive. I think it was after the guts had gone out of it, it was almost beginning to look back at it. And yeah. saying what you just said, which is anybody can, you know, In the end, in, in the end, the thing became so simplistic. Yeah. And I think that's a very, what well, the point I'm making is it's a very different psychological instinct to the Hafner reaction. Which is no more megastructures, mega structures, now we yeah. make the analysis. Right, yeah. We well, Peter, I think, I, I think in the case of Hafner, in fact, that, uh, that he is fundamentally the mathematician he always was. Yeah. And yeah. that, uh, in fact, the megastructure thing, he was dragged into it and, and kind of was doing a bit of bandwagoning, I suppose. But the last time I saw him, which is two years ago, I mean, there was still the fundamental mathematician thing, and this just happened to be um, a convenient kind of operation that happened to be appropriate to, at the time and in that particular circumstance. You, you can in fact see a fair number of uh, German-speaking academics, I think, who were through uh, megastructure, because, <coughs> not to be true in Hafner's case, uh, they were interested in things like closest pattern geometry and other mathematical oh. exercises. Oh and then went through megastructure and came out the other side, as you say, mathematicians, again, yeah. or mathematicians yeah. still. Uh, I think it's probably the closest back in geometry thing which gets many of them into the act. They were probably, I mean, they, 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 were, they were consulted, come on, you know, come on down, man, you're good at math, tell us how to make this thing fit yeah. together, uh, and got dragged in at that stage because the, the Dominican foot model has certainly implications of closest back in geometry. In fact, it doesn't really look into it. But, you know, in fact, the cubes and the diagonals 
who in fact give you one fairly familiar closest packing pattern if they bother to pursue it any length. Uh, I didn't really sort of hit me until after I'd come away, and I hadn't had to ask them about it. Yeah. That's a, the, that's that's my way, um, that fascinates me, which is, um, I didn't think I'd use it, but Chris King, Jerry Brown, who were a couple of days, excuse me, um, which, which I think is a funny character again as a reaction mm. that um, links the world of megastructures with the um, mystically key drop out world. Now that was, that's a funny territory, and actually the link there is, is the bucket. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very funny by way because again it's totally different from our by it's totally different from the, the Austrian mathematics. <coughs> it's another one again which is. Somehow, the megastructure seemed to be the, for them, the ideal non thing upon which you could climb up and drop out. It's and a very interesting thing <coughs> about the, their presentation. I think Cedric was there on one of the presentations. Very weird uh, kind of presentation of a megastructure which was deliberately crudely made and had yeah. things like silk stockings and babies yeah. and, and jelly. jelly yeah, and yeah, hand yeah. turn mm. cardboard light. <laughs> um, and it's a funny, but even partic again, particularly English byway, but they were with Bucky, with his yeah. friends, and there's the link. But they weren't, I, I'm sort of vaguely remembering that, they weren't the only examples of where the mega structure, you didn't infill it properly. Yeah. You didn't even make it properly. Um, but it, it was a kind of, uh, it had a sort of mystic quality, I think. But isn't it also, I mean, to use the terminology we've been using here, isn't it the Homo Ludens thing again? The megastructure itself becomes the game. Yeah. It doesn't you make, anything. Not simply the megastructure as, so to speak, the three-dimensional chessboard yeah. on which the game happens, but the game is making the megastructure. Yeah. Uh, which I think is something which does, in fact, come back from Bucky and some of Bucky's <coughs> games, uh, the world game and so on, as played in real life, <coughs> the main problem was building the gizmology to make the world game happen. And when the world game itself started, everyone got bored and went away because they didn't wish to know all those embarrassing facts about the world. But building the gizmology to make the world game possible uh, was up for a major academic exercise throughout the mid 60s and early 70s. Made an extent that Bucky began to complain about it. I think the other thing too, but I think both Bucky and the, uh, the ability to make or get away with megastructures are both very liberating influences. I mean, Bucky persistently appears listed as guru to people like, say, Moshe Safdie. Now, I can see no Bucky influence in Safdie's work at all, but I think Bucky's visit to McGill uh, and the other places where Moshe Safdie encountered him were extremely liberating experiences for Safdie. Got him thinking big, got him thinking in systems and so forth, and that really would take off. I think two things work very much together. Uh, in that sort of way, probably aren't really connected at all. I think Lady Malinano is quite wrong in including uh, Bucky as one of the ancestors of megastructure. The, the interesting thing is, though, that Safter's later schemes, um, wherever they were, I can never yeah. remember, yeah. but he worked with Lindsay, uh, who, who's a Bucky man from way back. Uh, Do you know Lindsay? Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a fairly complex relationship yeah. there. But they um, work very closely mm -hmm. on two or three. I mean, well, Lindsay claims that, anyway. I think, I think it's true, because yeah. it turns up persistently in the credits on the number of Safdie's yes. schemes. Uh, and Safdie's talked about Lindsay, so talk about, you know, what, uh, <coughs> if there's mathematics in there, Lindsay did. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Hafner, the, the, I, I'm not absolutely sure about this, but when he left Graz, I think mm. went to Harvard and um, did a class with Yona when yeah. Yona was moving into mathematics right. as well. Yeah. That was prior to UCLA. Yeah, and Friedman also hit Austria when he was just getting on the mathematics yes. thing. You know, just on that sort of channel. A lot of funny linkages. That yeah, right. But I mean, they're all carried by the world of teaching. Oh, sure. It's the yeah. thing. You know, that is the network. It's got all this talent moving around the world. It's not so much the building and building, not the normal migrations of architects. It's a different network, a different rate of movement over the Earth's surface too, which is the product of a particular period of, of affluent academia, I think, or, or particular product of, of great affluence and ambition in the architecture schools. And the, the talents of these people being competed for 
And there was, in a sense, I mean, in a sense, it's appropriate that the Dominican foot scheme should have won that Grand Prix because it was almost a kind of championship category every year for the school to produce the biggest or craziest megastructure to a good deal of comparing notes in the middle 60s, yes. you know, on who had got the tallest model or the most detailed model yes. or the model with the most lights yeah. The model the most convincing monorail and, through it. and, and the yeah. moving parts. There was mm -hmm. one at UCLA that Schulitz did right. with Warren yeah. that had the most amazing uh, motorized pieces. Did so that turn it, up in the in, in the Bucky show in uh, Bloomsbury Square Garden too? I don't know. There was something which I think What's in was like that. on slide or film. No, the thing. Yeah. Uh, the <coughs> it's, it does still <coughs> exist. A pyramidal di diamond form structure that's yeah. at this kind of size. Was it was, really it was still in UCLA yeah. a year ago, right. I know. Mm. Yeah. Peter, can I, at the risk of, of uh, you're you're painting Sundance further, but... Well, you'll get a bad press, whatever you say. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I think if I can just comment on, on the sort of teaching thing. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> the funny thing personally was that, that uh, the colour side of the up the plug in just before I started teaching, a week before, which was quite funny. Yeah. So one never ha had a chance, you know, one never stood a chance to, to, to not be labeled. Right. But yeah. what was interesting, I think, was that a lot of people in, in about that period, 64, 65, who were doing what I think you would call megastructures, mm. um, got in on it via another net. I mean, were doing things which they weren't calling megastructures, which they would see as extensions of the good old sort of 1950s, early 1960s linear planning. Oh, that yes. was a much right. more frequent thing. Mm. And the setback spectrum. Yeah. And a bit of, of um, multi-level deck. I mean, a lot mm. of it came via that guys, and even the authors Think of it as a, as a multi level, level deck scheme with rather complicated nodes and maybe some human sticking up. You yeah. really couldn't tell. No, well, well, I mean, and then the other thing was, was I, mean, I, I personally think that the Woods Berlin thing is a mega structure. For another reason, which is the, the usefulness of the model, it's a very famous one, 65, was the most discussed. Um, Organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what was interesting was you could always refer to it as a good example of the the relationship between the servicing line, whether composite or and the degree of flexibility of the vehicle. You know, the, 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 the sort of formula that the more intensive the servicing line, the more intensive the mega structure. The more they say that the infilling could be, or conversely, the more definitive the infilling and the more locked the infilling, then the looser the carrying structure. And I can remember this conversation coming up in Jura 65, 66, many times, and always one used uh, used to make it about schemes that were derived from Berlin, or one used Berlin. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's only three stories high is really very incidental. And I think personally, that it was very central to mega structure thinking. Yeah. And the three stories is really, I, you see, this is where I get worried about the, the word, again, the word structure, implying the big thing. Uh, I think that, for me at the time, mega structure was much more concerned with that, the concept of carrying and, yeah. and liberating. Yeah. And size wasn't really, you know, it could almost be three houses long. Yeah. And one story. No, I think I think the emphasis on the structure is to some extent the academic squares getting back on the act. You know <coughs> that this was something which everybody in this school was supposed to know about. And the structures were something you failed regularly, uh, and it's a part of the obsessive mental uh, apparatus of any architecture school traditionally. Uh, and so there was a, there was a kind of magic or big juju or bogey word in some sense. Uh, and to conceive a great structure you know, was somehow to have beaten an important piece of the game uh, and became more important. I mean, many of them are only structures. Uh, I mean, say that the Glen Small projects for redoing most of the lower part of Los Angeles, you know, you cannot get from the very beautiful romantic diagrams uh, of this great 
partially tensile structures are staggering about over torrents and down in places like that. From that to the detailed imagery of hanging gardens and so on. Mm. The intermediate stages aren't mm. there. Two, it seems to me, I mean, there's a Glenn Small and I'll be back on the line again, that two different things, a romantic vision of the habitable garden in one extreme and uh, an old time structure obsession at the other extreme does not make at all. Two completely separate things have happened uh, in its projects as published. Um, but it is, you know, and then what is nowadays referred to as the megastructure class at USC is almost entirely concerned, in fact, with doing very big space grids over very large areas. Uh, like, I suppose, what we're talking the finest hour of that kind of thing, uh, the, over the central plaza at Osaka in 70, which I can't make a megastructure of at all. It's, to me, yeah. it's simply a big, what Pleasants would call a planar grid. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, it's persistently described as a megastructure, not just the US, but all sorts of places. But in the end, Sort of given certain reactionary tendencies, always there in architectural schools and architectural teaching. In the end, the old familiar business of putting up a frame <coughs> take dominance over all the other things that the building might be doing or might contain. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the early 60 megastructures I can I can recall was flexibility, variability, extendability, yeah. etc. Yeah. Et I can never recall the word indeterminacy. And you used it tonight in relation to Berlin. Yeah. And I can't recall it being used mm. in the time of Berlin. And I feel that uh, indeterminacy has uh, an implied, uh, uh, not necessarily user control, but possibly con conditions conditioned untidiness mm. element yeah. about it. Which megastructures, although they ran off pages and things, tended to be. Um, uh, have a unit neatness and completeness. So although they, they could go on, yeah. they, I can't remember ever using the word indeterminacy in relation to anything I did, or I can't remember well, the did you I mean, did you I it can, Well, I can remember you, do, you wrote an article in that American Design, design Quarterly. quarterly. Yeah. Um, when on was that? 60? Yes. That oh, but yeah, I mean, you used it on the duet this week. Right. So we yeah. can't already use the word. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, I think I'm using yeah. 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 the word indeterminacy because that is part of my architectural yeah. culture. It's a rather specific one, yeah. rather the general one, the rest of it. Yeah. 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 And for us up there, certainly the concept of indeterminacy was a kind of uh, Paul Manto concept, which included very good. Well, it, yeah, and I remember. Yeah. yeah as, well. as presented by John Weeks and his lordship, <coughs> that, that's certainly yeah. true. Yeah. But it seemed to me somehow to be an appropriate word for, for the Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. No, I yeah. think you're right, quite right. I don't know if you've ever used that yeah. except for cases where John Weeks sat in on jurors. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody else would use it that Which was after Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was after Berlin. No, but the argument starts out. I can't remember when John's first article on it. It certainly wasn't used in relation to, to, to a megastructure. Except by me, I said you're quite right mm. about the. Uh, well, you re I remember you referring to Walking City as being geographically indeterminate. Yes, right. Yes. Very smart, that. Day, <laughs> I think also it's, it's for, for the record that uh, <laughs> the, the John Weeks <laughs> Norfolk yeah. Park Hospital and so on <laughs> is in fact not as indeterminate as they would like to think. Uh, that's a whole another argument. It's another <laughs> argument, but it's just, I want to make a point. <laughs> no, it is a good point, because I think it reminds me of how different perspectives of this system have been put together, which is why I have to ask questions about what was, why I have to find out what was going on in the schools at the time to make megastructure model making such an apparently irresistible and seductive uh, activity. You know, because certainly I was moving at the time on an intellectual network which was really interested in that kind of stuff. Although I think uh, a good deal of stuff had come out of the um, bar that being John John uh, thing is related. I mean, the idea of the indeterminate or long university or a street down the middle, um, which arrives at something like a megastructure with John Andrew Scarborough College, uh, also, of course, produces the original Mike Cassidy diagram on which the plan of uh, uh, Warwick was based. I mean, in the first instance, they are, I think, closely related kinds of thinking. The final built solutions are radically different 
But in both cases, there was the idea of the continuous public pedestrian concourse space linking everything together, which could be developed in a kind of mega structure of one extreme, or simply in a kind of open street solution, uh, yeah. as the worry for the other. Yeah. Yeah. I do not feel that uh, some of the work that was done with mega structures was closely linked to the developments in biology and uh, atomic theory, particularly in the development in play things of the atomic uh, construction models. D6 and, and things like that. And yeah. the uh, tremendous publicity that was given to the development of DNA and RNA. Helical, helical, double helical <coughs> structure, uh, which can be seen in some of the, in the, some of the particularly underground I, I, think that, I think that's wisdom after the event. I'm not correct. No, I'd like to know that. The importance of the D-stick model in many of these uh, uh, tetrahedral structures and so on were yeah. made with the D-stick kit or the thing to drive from normal ball and stick atomic models. That's certainly true. Uh, but I'm slightly surprised myself I haven't had a slide of the atomium uh, at Brussels on, yeah. on the screen because I think that is one of the possible sources of the idea of a diagonal structure with communications in the diagonals. I don't know whether uh, anyone's consciously aware of that. Again, with hindsight, that looks like that. But uh, I don't know about the double helix, uh, when that entered the general consciousness. I mean, the last thing was in the window in the basement in Gower Street, a lot of it, I worked past it twice a day, before I suddenly realized what it was. It was a good, I mean, the world seemed so full. I mean, that's, that's a fair point. The world seemed so full of ball and stick models at the time. It was a long time, but I suddenly realized that that was a great, great double helix model uh, sitting there. Because one saw so many of those things. Now, I think that is a good point. Uh, and I think maybe it's things like the Atomium and the Brussels things trying to bring that kind of thinking into the architectural argument. But plus also the whole, and there again, you're right, all the different toys and things, which are based on that, which of course, and this is interesting, that's something I hadn't fully copied before, picks up another ancient architectural theme, something that my own PhD students will explain to me. But the origins of the ball and stick model are in fact the, here again I'm correcting by experts, the second or third of the Freudian gifts. Yeah, are the third gift, aren't they? Dry, dry peas and toothpicks. Uh, now, I mean, that has a, a long and respectable history in architecture and architectural educational thinking. All that stuff taken up by the Bauhaus from Froebel. What I never <coughs> realized until Jack Paul did his thesis was that Froebel was a failed architect. And long before Froebel started messing with people's minds, a favorite popular architect, uh, he had in fact started on an architectural training. Uh, and his obsession with those basic geometrical forms, including the open grid forms, uh, uh, in fact probably reflects something of his architectural background which he projected onto the, the, the training of preschool children. So there is, in fact, a long, complex history there. I'm saying I've had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> thank you for reminding me of it. That's precisely why these chats were given, why they're so half-baked, you know, is because they're full of gaps and bits and pieces that I need to be reminded of that. Thank you very much. I was rather surprised by this evening, two sentences in which the structure seems to have come out of the top is that once one is being played in the school mm. and the other one is being designed as a toy um, to be looked at by spectators and spectators. Mm. The aspect which hasn't come up, which I sort of thought of more, was that if the thing was actually built, it was therefore used as an educational toy to live in, um, which is more a notion I felt it a lot, particularly last week in the expo mm. film, the idea of this is a toy you work walk through. And particularly because um, of some of the things which Solera said about Arthur Sandy and about how he wants this to develop as not as a school, but as an educational environment where no school will be long with any longer mm. Well, Mr. Price is sitting right in front of you, uh, and uh, there's very little doubt that uh, his and Joe Littlewood's Fun Palace project was in fact a giant educational toy, and the phrase was used. And at the end of uh, Dominic and Hood's explanation of the great Ragnitz model, there's something which is certainly in 
something of the same line of capital. The capability of the individual, which today is stupidly misused in our capital and its carpet in the States, must be rerouted and activated. Legitimate individual effort is the starting point of creative activity and thought. The crevasse of misunderstanding between art and the masses will thus disappear. Uh, and although I don't think the phrase homo ludens is actually turns up here, there is a strong sense in that model of uh, play as an educational experience. <coughs> uh, no, I th I mean, that is a theme which persists through a great deal uh, of this. I think to some extent it may have been, as it were, an excuse, a way of legitimating the structures was to claim that they were educational at a time when heavy investment in education was going on with a highly respectable subject. But most of the really interesting megastructure projects <coughs> which have anything to say about education do very much see it as play as education. Uh, the megastructure could indeed be treated as a giant toy in some sense. Right. Yeah. I don't agree with you entirely. This is the end of the megastructure, especially in this school. Mm -hmm. And not because I have...